Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. I woke up this morning and I looked out the window and I thought to myself, uh-oh. Uh, but then by about 2 o'clock, I was like, oh, okay. So uh, I, normally I would congratulate you for braving the elements, but they actually weren't too bad by the time 6 o'clock rolled around. But I'm very grateful that you're here on a Friday night. Um, I'm especially grateful that our speaker is here on a Friday night. When I first invited her uh, to come here to the Ford to speak, uh, I said, well, we have an open date in February, and she replied, well, I went to uh, graduate school at the University of Wisconsin, and I'm not traveling to the Midwest in February, <laughs> <laughs> which was wise, uh, except I neglected to point out to her that March is really not that different than February, uh, but fortunately she got in uh, okay yesterday and uh, got to enjoy uh, a, a sliver of sunlight today. Uh, our speaker tonight, uh, you have the program in front of you, Dr. Angel adams Parham from the University of Virginia. Uh, I met Dr. Parham last fall. Uh, we were at an event together, and uh, the first panel, uh, a panelist spoke, and she stood up after the panel and asked a question. And I was sitting in the audience, and I kind of did, I was like, wow, that's a really interesting question. Um, and then uh, she and I were on a panel together about education. And uh, I won't rehearse for you what I said uh, at that time. But it's, it's, uh, at, at that point, I had uh, taken this job here at the Ford Foundation. And I thought, well, I can actually do better educational work outside the academy than I can inside the academy. But Dr. Parham is doing excellent educational work inside the academy. So hopefully between the two of us, uh, we have this covered pretty well. Uh, as you know, the people who developed our constitutional system were students of history. And if you read the documents around uh, the founding of, of uh, American, the American Republic, you'll see constant references to the ancient world. Uh, and this has been really a constant in American history, is that we can't really understand our present or have a good sense of where we're going unless we have not only a keen sense of our past and knowledge of our past, but an appreciation for it, uh, a, a sense of gratitude for it. And uh, this was really the essence of Dr. Parham's speech that I heard her give uh, last September, I think it was. And uh, uh, that part of the problem in our contemporary politics is we don't know where we are and we don't know where we're going because we don't know where we're from. Uh, and so she is actively engaged in efforts uh, to remind people of, uh, of our heritage, uh, of our inheritance, uh, to, to appreciate it, but also, as you should do with any inheritance, to figure out where you can improve it, where it needs to be improved, because they all need to be improved. So uh, she comes to us from the University of Virginia, and uh, she uh, has a PhD in sociology, but at lunch today, I, I commented, I said, are you sure you're not actually a historian? But she assured me that she was uh, a sociologist. And I'm thrilled to have her here in Grand Rapids in March. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Angel adams Perry. Good evening. It is really such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Jeff, so much for the, the gracious introduction and invitation. And thank you to Gleaves as well for having me here. Um, it is really an inestimable honor to be before you this evening. So 
I am going to be speaking to you about traditions in dialogue. I'm going to divide this into two parts. So the first part of my talk is going to have to do with where we are right now. What are some of the challenges that we are dealing with? and the way that we think about American education, and this is bound up very intimately with the way we think about history. After I lay some of the groundwork there, then I wanna to turn to kind of a more practical bent and just make a proposal for a renewed way of thinking about education um, that cast a vision that I think could take us onto a road that is perhaps more promising than some of what we have gotten mired in today. So to start out with our current challenges, we are engaged with many struggles over how to engage with the past. What should our posture be toward complicated aspects of our past that are very difficult for us to deal with? And what value is there in studying classic text and primary documents, especially primary documents of the American founding? And we're engaged with some very thorny questions about the American project itself, who are we as Americans? And is the American project fundamentally good or fundamentally flawed? So I'm sure any of you, if you have even passingly been paying attention to the news in the last few years, you know that we've been having this kind of cultural tug of war over the past. How to think about the past, how to think about the American project, right? Um, so the 1619 project of the New York Times, um, probably by now well-known opening, our democracy's founding ideals were false when they were written. Black Americans have fought to make them true. The United States is a nation founded on both an ideal and a lie. Okay, so one way of thinking about the past. And then the response, at least one of the responses, has been more of a framework in terms of thinking about 1776 as the organizing way of thinking about the American founding and who we are as Americans. In the course of human events, there have always been those who deny or reject human freedom, but Americans will never falter in defending the fundamental truths of human liberty proclaimed on July 4th, 1776. We will, we must always hold these truths. So as I look out at the landscape, of this conversation and what's going on and, and all of the tug of wars we're having over curricula here and there. Um, what comes to me in the historical work that I do and the reason I love historical work so much is that while history does not repeat itself, I am convinced that it does rhyme and that there are echoes of the past quite often. Right? And I think that the study of primary documents and great writers can really help us to see where the conversation we're having today rhymes or echoes with the past. And if others who are much smarter than I ha am have gone through this before me, I think that we should listen to what they've had to say to help us put into perspective what we're dealing with today and to think about how can we learn from what has gone before, right? Um, and so this is one of the reasons that I'm so um, convinced that we need to look to the past, look to great writers, founding documents, and so on, um, to even try to have the conversation that we're having now in a more productive way. So I wanna revisit um, the American founding through the eyes of Phyllis Wheatley, first of all. And some of you have probably heard of her, others of you may not have heard of her. Um, she was a very um, impressive young woman with an incredible history and very, very great talent. So who was she? Who was Phyllis Wheatley? So she was born in West Africa. Um, we are not exactly sure where. We think it is prob might be somewhere in the region of Senegal. So Timothy Fitch was a, a wealthy Boston merchant who was in the slave trade, and he sent his agent to West Africa to find and to get Africans for the slave trade, right? And he sent off saying, you know, bring back lots of very strong young men. That's who we want. Didn't go the way he wanted, and they ended up coming back with many women and children, Phyllis among them. Phyllis was fairly sickly when she arrived, 
Um, we think that she was seven years old because she had her front two teeth missing. And if any of you have had children, you know that that's about the age they are when they are missing their front two teeth. Hard to imagine what that would have been like as a seven-year-old being ripped from her parents, put in the bottom of a foul-smelling slave ship, and brought over to the Americas, to Boston. Very, very hard to imagine what that was like. So she gets there. She gets the eye of the Wheatleys. And there are different thoughts about why they chose her. Um, prime among them is the fact that Susanna Wheatley, the wife, uh, well, both she and John had lost three children, one of them who was about the same age that Phyllis was when they found her. And so there was a sense that maybe that was part of what attracted Susanna Wheatley especially to Phyllis. And that was the reason that they brought her and took her home. So to their credit, they realized that she was incredibly, incredibly gifted. They allowed her to have an education, to learn how to read and write, which was not common at the time. She learned English very quickly, um, and she learned alongside of their two children. So she is growing up around the time of the revolution. She is still a quite young woman, and she is living just down the street from the Boston Massacre. Right? So you can just imagine all of what is in you know, the, the everyday conversation about what is going on. She's picking all of this up. And I always like to emphasize, um, so as you'll see, she was very much for the revolution, for the American Revolution, for liberty. But I like to emphasize the choice that Africans had at this time. So it wasn't the kind of thing where, well, you know, of course we were going to support the revolution. It depended on what you thought you were going to get out of it. After all, at a certain point, the British were offering Africans, especially African men who would fight their freedom. And so there was a choice to be made. She could have just said, you know what, I'm a young enslaved girl. Why, who do I care? It's their revolution. But that's not how she thought. She was very keenly set on the idea of freedom. And she was very affirmatively in support of the American Revolution and the American founding. So it was her choice to do this and her choice to write about the revolution as well in a very forthright way. So th these are a few lines from one of her early poems. So this is on the death of um, a young man named Mr. Snyder. And this actually predated the Boston Massacre. But she wrote a poem in homage to him, and she saw him as one of the first martyrs of the revolution. And so this is her honoring his life. In heaven's eternal court it was decreed, thou the first martyr for the common good, long hid before a vile infernal here, prevents Achilles in his mid-career. Where this fury darts his poisonous breath, all are endangered to the shafts of death. The generous sires beheld the fatal wound, saw their young champion gasping on the ground. So she is early on very keenly attuned to what's happening, very in support of the revolution. And as a teenager, she's got enough poetry together to put together a volume. And John Wheatley is very supportive of her trying to get it published. She tries to get this volume published in 1772 in Boston and is not able to get the subscribers together. Then as now, publishing was not easy. You had to show that there was going to be a market and you had subscribers who signed up in advance who said that they would buy it. So that didn't work. But interestingly, later that year, a representative from the Earl of Dartmouth, um, a Mr. Woolridge, was in Boston, so the Earl of Dartmouth was in England, and he had just been appointed um, as secretary for the colonies. And so he, Woolridge, was visiting Boston, and he said, I've heard all about this young African. I don't think it's true. Is she really writing all this poetry herself? I need to go and see. So he shows up at her doorstep, and he says, I hear that you write all of this great poetry. I want to see you write a poem right now, right? Um, and she says, okay. 
And he says, and I'm going to give you the title, I mean, not the title, the subject of your poem. I want you to write about my boss, the Earl of Dartmouth. Interesting. She happened to know who the Earl of Dartmouth was. She was very plugged in politically, and she said, okay, good, I'll do it. So she puts this poem together, and what's fascinating about this poem, and I'll share a few lines from it, is that you see her personality in this poem. You see how very politically savvy she was and how very smart she was. So here's from the beginning. Hail happy day when smiling like the morn, fair freedom rose New England to adorn. The northern clime beneath her genial ray, Dartmouth congratulates thy blissful sway. So what's going on in this first part of it? So he's just been appointed to this new position. She is emphasizing freedom from the beginning, and she's saying congratulations to you, Dartmouth. And we'll see that she has another message for him as she keeps going. Elate with hope her race no longer mourns, each soul expands, each graceful bosom burns, while in thy hand with pleasure we behold the silken reins and freedom's charms unfold long lost to realms beneath the northern skies. So she seems to be saying, so you are newly appointed to oversee us, but I'm so sure that you're going to prize freedom. You're going to use silken reins to govern us and not reins of iron. So she's flattering him, right? She's very aware of what the politics are in the situation and she's emphasizing freedom throughout. Then she goes on. Should you, my lord, while you peruse my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung? Whence flow these wishes for the common good by feeling hearts alone best understood? I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Afric's fancied happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest? What sorrows labor in my parents' breast? So she's making this equation between her own loss of freedom and the cause of freedom that those in the colonies want to uphold, right? And I think this is part of the reason that she was so passionate about the American Revolution. She saw freedom as being at the root of it, freedom for herself, as well as freedom for the new country in the making. Many people don't know this, but she had a letter exchange and a poem dedicated to George Washington. This is the other reason she's one of my favorite people to study when we think about the American founding, what it means to be American, and so on and so forth. So she writes this poem while he's still the general in the revolution, extolling him you know, in great terms, and then she sends a letter along with it, and he responds to her. And he says, I am so flattered. Um, if it weren't... Um, seeming self-centered, I would publish your poem, but it's about me. Um, so he, he doesn't publish it, but then a friend publishes it. Um, so the, the poem is published, it's widely circulated, um, and it is a really fascinating exchange to see. And this is one of the kinds of things, um, one of the kinds of stories that often doesn't get told very much. And moving on from Phyllis Wheatley, in terms of this larger question about how do we think about the past and how do we think about very difficult aspects of the past in terms of race and justice and so on. So I want to give you um, some debates that went on um, among black intellectuals about what is the American project, you know, how do we think about the difficult past. Many of you have probably heard about Frederick Douglass. You may not have heard of Alexander Crummel. And these are two representative codes that give you a sense of the differences that they had in terms of how should we think about the past. So Douglas, from what to the slave is the 4th of July, America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false to the future. Crummel says, the morbid, absorbing, and abiding recollection of slavery, what is it but the continuance of that same condition in memory and dark imagination? So very different ways of thinking about the past. So who was Crummel? Fascinating man, he was born free in New York City in 1819. He attended the African Free School that was founded by the New York Manumission Society. 
and he studied at Cambridge in England and accepted a pastoral position in Liberia, which was a place that um, some Africans from the United States were, went to to set up. So he had a way of thinking about the past where he, in this speech, said we should be very careful about dwelling in the worst parts of our past. He says, if men will put themselves in narrow and straightened grooves, if they will morbidly divorce themselves from large ideas and noble convictions, they are sure to bring distress, pettiness, and misery into their being. For the mind of man was made for things grand, exalted, and majestic. So he is saying this in the 1890s. We're only about a generation post-emancipation. And he goes on to make this distinction between what he calls recollection and memory. And he says, it's not so much that I don't want you to remember slavery, but I don't want it to be constantly recollected. Because if it's constantly recollected, it's going to drag us down. It's going to make it very difficult to move forward and do something new. Right? So he has this whole philosophy about the past and how one should think about the past. Very different than Frederick Douglass's approach. So Douglass is born in 1818. He's born into slavery, uh, whereas Crummel is born free in New York City. He begins to learn how to read when he goes to a couple in Baltimore where the wife starts to teach him. But then shortly after the wife starts to teach him how to read, the husband stops her and says, if you teach him how to read, he will be forever unfit to be a slave. And he was. The, when Mr. Ald said that, he was so vehement and so angry that Douglas said, now I'm starting to understand where the road to freedom lies. And he determined that if he did nothing else, he was going to learn how to read. And so he would play games with the boys in the community, and he would kind of trick them into helping him learn how to read, because it wasn't legal for slaves to learn how to read for very good reasons. If you want to keep someone enslaved, absolutely keep them ignorant. But the other practical reason is that if an enslaved person could read or write, they could write their own pass. So at this time, if you were black, you had to have either freedom papers or you had to have a pass written by your owner showing that you had permission to be in the streets to go from one place to another. If you were an enslaved person who could read and write, you could write your own pass. And that's exactly what he did. Once he learned how to read and write, he wrote passes. Right? So this was the beginning of his road to freedom, was learning how to read and to write. He bought a copy of a book called The Columbian Orator. The Columbian Orator was this reader that was used by young schoolboys, and it had classic speeches going back to antiquity, everything from Socrates up to founding father speeches. And so they would read this, and it was a way of learning rhetoric. And this is probably one of the places that he really trained in rhetoric, was reading the Columbian Orator. And one of the, the dialogues in there, there were a number of dialogues in the Columbian Orator, and the one that he writes about in his narrative that really struck him was the dialogue between a master and a slave. And in this dialogue between a master and a slave, the enslaved person uses this excellent logic that wins the master over and the master gives the enslaved person his freedom. And so Douglas is reading this while he is an enslaved young boy. And so he's getting more and more of this kind of intellectual arsenal, um, as well as more and more of this determination in his spirit to be free. Right? And it's through reading these great speeches, this great literature. And I will, um, when I come to the more practical part of the talk um, and how I orient young people toward this kind of classic learning, I'll give you some you know, actual examples of how I think this is still happening today. So what did Douglas have to say about the past? So Douglas was actually at that speech that Crummel gave and he vehemently disagreed with him. He said, I, I don't agree with you at all. I think we have to remember, right? So here in 1871, he says, we are sometimes asked in the name of patriotism to forget the merits of this fearful struggle, he's talking about the Civil War, and to remember with equal admiration those who struck at the nation's life and those who struck to save it. <laughs> 
those who fought for slavery and those who fought for liberty and justice. But we are not here to applaud manly courage, save as it has been displayed in a noble cause. We must never forget that victory to the rebellion meant death to the republic. And he gives a similar um, line here, which I won't, I won't read. Um, but I highlight this debate between Crummel and Douglas to say that there has been this constant stream of us trying to have this conversation as a country, trying to think it through, trying to wrestle it through um, with various kinds of, of logics and reasoning. And I think it's very important to draw on some of that discussion and some of those different frameworks of the past to inform where we are today. Another debate between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois on political change and progress, um, as well as on thinking about the past and how do we work toward justice, right? That is a very big question today. Justice seems to be on the lips of so many people. What does that mean? How does one get that? Um, and there was a very big debate in the 19th century post-emancipation for in the black community of how to do this. So Booker T. Washington, born in slavery in 1856, Following emancipation, he works in the salt mines, not pleasant work at all. He walks across Virginia, gets an education at Hampton Institute, and then founds Tuskegee in 1881. Always working extremely hard, sweating, working with his hands. Um, but very much a man of integrity and hard work. Um, but he and Du Bois differed quite a bit on how to go about social and political change. So this is a paragraph taken from the Atlanta Exposition speech in 1895. He says, cast down your bucket among my people. So I should say the audience that he is talking to is largely white, all right? So he's talking to a largely white audience and he's talking about how they should be oriented toward black Americans. Cast down your bucket among my people, who have, without strikes, tilled your fields, cleared your forests, built your railroads and cities, and brought forth treasures from the bowels of the earth. While doing this, you can be sure in the future, as in the past, that you and your families will be surrounded by the most patient, faithful, law-abiding, and unresentful people that the world has seen. In all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one is the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. As you might imagine, this did not fall on black ears quite the way it fell on the ears of his white audience. And Du Bois was chief among the critics. So Du Bois had a very different background. He was born free in the North. He was educated in a small community, um, interracial education, black and white families gathered around him, recognized how smart he was, and made sure he got an excellent education. So he was kind of the polar opposite of the background of Booker T. Washington. He goes to college at Fisk and Harvard. He studies in Germany. And he's the first African American to get a PhD from Harvard. So completely different background. When he thinks about political and social change, he directly addresses Washington. And he says, this is not the way. We have to fight in a forthright way for our rights. And in Souls of Black Folk, he lays out what he thinks has to happen. The right to vote, civic equality, and the education of youth according to ability, including a classic liberal arts education. So there's this huge debate between the two of them on education, with Booker T. Washington saying, um, the vast majority need a very practical, hands-on education. Very few people, if any, are going to get the liberal education. And Du Bois says, of course you need some people doing that practical work, but far more people than you're thinking, Washington, need this classic liberal arts education. We are educating people, humans, not just cogs in a machine. Um, and the, the woman who I would put here that I didn't put in the slides, who I think had really the best synthesis, is Anna Julia Cooper, who's writing at the same time. And she has a way of putting it where she said, even a seamstress or the most humble person, you have to remember that you are educating a person with a soul. And that even if you're going to educate them to be a seamstress, they should still be thinking about these higher and beautiful things. And that's part of what I try to do in the work that I do with young people today. So come back to our current challenges. How 
What should our posture be toward complicated, difficult aspects of the past? What value is there in studying the classics and primary documents? Who are we as Americans? And is the American project fundamentally good or fundamentally flawed? This very quick run through some of the debates in the past gives us some material to kind of think with. It helps us to think with it, I think, in a way that is less polarized than what we have been doing right now as a country. So what I want to do is to think about if we were going to envision a different kind of education, a different approach to doing this kind of teaching, what could that look like that would be more fruitful than what we're doing now? And what I'm proposing is a, an approach to educating that brings these traditions together. So classics and the Western canon together with the black intellectual tradition. What would that look like moving forward? So there are some very rich gifts of the classical and the canonical tradition. It invites our students to become part of the great conversation on what is true, good, and beautiful. It's far too little of truth, goodness, and beauty, I think, in our schools today. Right? So a kind of education that would invite them to think about these questions like, what does it mean to be human? What is the essence of freedom? What is goodness? What's a good life? What is justice? Those are the kinds of questions that we're thinking about. Cultivating the moral imagination and deepening cultural literacy. The gifts of the black intellectual tradition give us historical models of faith, hope, and love in the face of oppression. Encouragement to those who are struggling today, and I can't emphasize this enough, because often when people think about a classical liberal arts education, they are assuming that it's for the elite and that it is not something that is for those who are struggling or from very humble backgrounds. But I argue, on the contrary, it's especially for those who are struggling and are from humble backgrounds, especially for them. And I've very much found that in the work that I do. And I also think the black intellectual tradition gives us the gift of the creation of beauty and demonstration of joy in difficult circumstances. So it's for this reason that I created my educational nonprofit, Nyansa Classical Community. We're about seven years old now. We started when I was still living in New Orleans. And our mission is to cultivate wisdom, knowledge and wisdom to transform a generation. And so we have done that by braiding together classical education and the black intellectual tradition and really weaving them together in a conversation that has been really very, very rich. The two um, images that you see here on either side of the screen are a really good example of this. They are from Romare Bearden's artistic work called The Black Odyssey. So he was an African-American artist and he did a whole visual meditation on Homer's Odyssey thinking about it um, from an African and African diasporic lens. And it's one of the most beautiful collections of artwork I can think of. And so with our kids in the program, we introduced them to this work and had them do artwork in the style of Romare Bearden's Black Odyssey. We write curricula for lower school and for upper school age children. And this is an example of the kinds of things that we do in the program. So we did a whole project around the Odyssey with artwork and reading, um, creative interpretations of the Greek gods and goddesses, which you'll see some images of, introducing Latin and biblical learning and literacy. And a note on the biblical learning and literacy, this is from the perspective of having the cultural knowledge because regardless of one's faith background, um, in order to read Western literature, it's very important to know some of that background. I'll never forget sitting in a college classroom and my students had read a story that very clearly drew on the story of Solomon and the two women and the dead baby. And I mean, it didn't say any of that in the story, but it was clearly drawing on that biblical story. And so I asked them, it was actually, I think it was set in China, the story. And I said, does this story ring any bells for you? Mm, everybody looks around. Mm, no? I said, really? Okay, anybody hear about King Solomon and two women? This is about 30 students. One very tentative hand went up. 
So I think there were two women and there was some baby somewhere involved. I mean, it, it was just nothing, almost nothing. The one student had an inkling of what might have happened in this story with King Solomon and the babies. Um, I have asked questions about Noah's Ark and gotten blank looks. Um, so this is the kind of thing where we say, you know, whatever the faith background or lack of faith background is immaterial. If you're going to be trying to study literature in any kind of Western tradition, you're going to have to have some kind of biblical literacy. And so we do have that in our curriculum as well. Cultivating virtue is a very big part of it. Um, and expanding the moral imagination through story and literature. And I'll, I'll say, say more about the moral imagination in just a moment. And then also emulating virtuous persons, right? So what can we learn from the lives of people who have lived well? So when I think about the moral imagination, there are different ways that you could describe it. I like philosopher John Keeks's definition here because what it focuses on is us making images that we then come to resemble. And this is how the moral imagination works. There is something compelling um, in a story, something compelling about the person. You put yourself in their place. So think about the story of Snow White. Are you more like Snow White or more like the wicked stepmother? Right? Who do you want to be? You know, probably not the wicked stepmother, I am guessing. Right? Um, and so what the moral imagination does is you are always thinking through, you're thinking, you know, you're putting yourself into the place of the people in the story. And it is inviting you to think larger. Taming the Heart of Virtue by Vegan Garoyan um, is a really wonderful read. And he talks about fairy tales and the importance of fairy tales. He taught a whole course on fairy tales at the University of Virginia for decades to college students. And you wouldn't think fairy tales. Fairy tales for college students is supposed to be for children, right? But what he found is that his students had been starved. Their moral imagination had been starved. Um, and part of the reason it was starved is because the fairy tales that we do have are so watered down. So many people only know the Disney version of fairy tales. They don't know the actual fairy tales. Interesting note, I grew up reading Grimm's fairy tales when I was very young, like nine or 10. And if you've never read the Grimm's fairy tales, I invite you to read them. Cinderella has a very different ending. Um, I'll just tell you there are some eyes missing by the time we get to the end. <laughs> but I won't tell you why they're missing. Um, so, you know, I was just carrying around this Grimm's fairy tale book, and the thing ha has fallen apart. The binding is gone. I read it backward and forward. So I got those original Grimm's fairy tales. They are rich. They are deep. They're wonderful. They have almost no resemblance to the Disney version of the fairy tales, almost none. So in Taming the Heart of Virtue, and he just came out with a second edition just last month, actually, um, really excellent. And the, the quotes that I've highlighted here, he's just talking about the importance of these great stories and how they form the way we think and imagine ourselves and how we pattern our lives. And they are filled with these deep moral lessons. And they inspire. They inspire young people in a way that watered down tales do not inspire. And so what he found is that his college students were hungry for this. They were very hungry for it in a world that has been stripped of enchantment and that is relentlessly focused often on materialism and science. Right? Um, so the moral imagination, so very important. When um, the friend that I co-founded this program with, when we had our first day, we had about seven students. They were about ages five to seven. We were both homeschoolers at the time. I homeschooled for about 13 years. And so we were used to reading a lot with our children. You know, we would just have, I remember my daughter, um, when she was four, I would sit down and just read to her for 20 minutes or more at a time. You know, even with no picture, she would just listen and just delight in these stories. 
When we sat down um, with our students, so we were working in the neighborhood I was living in, which was a, a low-income, largely African-American neighborhood. And we were living there, or I was living there with my family intentionally as part of our church's attempt to be part of uh, a neighborhood that was having a very hard time. So Danielle and I sit down and get ready to read the story, and we see that the children are not focused. They're not paying attention. They're not enraptured by the story. And we came to the end, and we were so puzzled. We said, well, our children are always enraptured by stories. What's going on? And what we discovered is that we had to build the habit of attention in the children. They hadn't, that habit of attention had not been built, most likely because they're plugged into various kinds of media. So over time, we had um, the same, a largely the same group of children come over and over, and we were able to build that up, build the habit of attention and the moral imagination. This is some of the kind of literature that we read and that we integrate into our curriculum. And this is the innovative project that we did with the Greek gods and goddesses when we were reading Greek mythology. So I engaged a very talented artist to imaginatively rethink what could these god, gods and goddesses have looked like if they were black and brown. And we did this because our children were largely black and brown, and it helped them to enter into the stories more fully. So I don't know how you are in your Greek mythology, if you have any idea who is on the left and who is on the right. Any guesses? Zeus is correct on the right. On the left? Athena. Athena. Very good. It's a quick audience. All right. So the other thing that we do um, in weaving the traditions together, when we were reading the Iliad just before the COVID pandemic, um, the young woman, the, the, the young woman on the far right that you see there was one of my college students. And she's also a spoken word artist. And so she would take each of the stories we were reading from the Iliad and she would put them into rhymed couplets just to summarize it, to make it poetry. And then she put it over beats and wrapped it. And the kids just ate it up. They memorized it, and they were chanting the Iliad everywhere. And I like to say this returns the Iliad to its rightful context. It was sung originally. It was an oral tradition. It was not something where people would sit staidly at their desk and open their books, right? This was something that was sung, that was rejoiced, that was enjoyed. And so that is what we would do with the kids. So um, the other thing is models of virtue, right? Who is it that we can look up to and emulate? Um, so biblical stories, like I said, expands cultural literacy and historical persons that we can model our lives on. So we think forthrightly in terms of virtues. These are some of the kinds of virtues that we seek to cultivate in the lessons that we have. This is an example from some of the Bible stories. There's lots of memory work to help young students to remember what's most important. This is from the Greek mythology on hospitality. And then in terms of real persons, um, we have beautiful biographies and memory sentences. This is Henriette Delisle, who was a free woman of color in New Orleans and who founded um, a religious order, a Catholic order, of other free women of color. And they did great works helping the poor and the sick um, in New Orleans. John Fox um, gave his life for his own soldiers. He saw that it was going to be very difficult for them to get out. And he called down on the radio and said, this is where you need to bomb even though he was going to be in that position. And he saved his men's lives by doing that. So they will read and they will learn about these different people and have memory sentences for them. 
One of my favorite is this poetry book. And I brought some copies that I will send around later for you to look through it. So the artist who did those Greek gods and goddesses is also a graphic designer. We had the children write poetry when we were learning about the Greek myths. And so inside this booklet are the children's poems and the artwork. And the pictures that you see here on the right is when they went to a diner owned by a lovely woman named Jane Wolfe, who bought 100 copies of this poetry book and gave it away to the patrons in the diner and invited our students to have lunch and to sign the poetry booklets. And so this is the kind of exciting opportunity that allowed them to see the fruit of their labor and the fruit of their study. Uh, in the upper school program, we put a lot of these texts in dialogue with each other, and I've given you some of my favorites. Um, so Plato's Allegory of the Cave, together with the part in Douglas's narrative where he's learning how to read. The two of those read well together. Plato's Apology, um, with Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail, because he cites Socrates from the Apology in that letter. And Homer's Iliad with the legend of Sundiata. The legend of Sundiata is from Mali. It's 14th or 15th century Mali in West Africa. And by studying those two epics together, the kids get a deeper sense of the art of the epic. We also have lots of art. And so they are learning about great masters of art and putting them into dialogue with more contemporary artists. So here you see the Pieta. And the Pieta on the right was inspiration for Kehinda Wiley, who is a contemporary African-American artist who has a, a very different interpretation, but it's in dialogue with the Pieta. Here is a drawing from one of the children in our program, from the upper school program. This is a 16-year-old who drew this. And I will also circulate a picture, a couple pictures of this in just a moment. And I'll be very curious to think, to ask you what you think is being portrayed here and why did this student draw this drawing? What is he trying to say? As of now, like I said, we're in year seven or it might actually be eight. We have had an elementary program after school in New Orleans for six years. We are now piloting our new upper school curriculum. We have sites in Houston, Northern Virginia, Georgia, and one in Uganda. And we are actively building new partnerships. The book you will learn more about, which the uh, museum here has very graciously provided in the store, and then this is a QR code invitation to learn more about the black intellectual tradition and the writers in the book. This was an event that we put on last November in Charlottesville, Virginia. And what we did was we had a storyteller read aloud selections from the different writers that we write about in the book. And after each of those readings, we did a performance of music from the time period. So the first reading was Ola Uda Equiano and his narrative of coming, being taken from West Africa and sold into slavery. But before he's taken, he writes about the wonderful dancing and drumming tradition in West Africa. And so then we had my daughter's African dance and drum group do a performance. The next was a reading by Phyllis Wheatley, who was an 18th century writer who I talked about earlier. And after that one, we um, had a string quartet that performed a composition by an 18th century composer, a black composer named Joseph Boulogne, Le Chevalier de Saint-Georges, which was just incredible to be able to do that. So I got to play the cello. That's me on the cello, um, a colleague from my department on the viola, and two professional violinists. And so that is a very fun group of readings and performances to learn more about the black intellectual tradition. So in sum, my argument here is that there is a much more fruitful way forward 
than where I see our political and educational dialogue has been, or it's not even a dialogue, I think. It's been more of a, a kind of shouting match between people. That there is a way of building on the conversations of the past, um, really digging deep into great writing and classic text that help to shape the minds of young people and thinking in a much more disciplined and creative and beautiful way about what it means to be a community together. And I'll leave it there. And I'm just gonna circulate some of those things that I talked about. We do have time for some questions. Yes. Are you hoping or considering creating a community here in Grand Rapids? So Jeff has been um, really very supportive about doing that here. And so it is my great hope that that would happen. Yes. Is this done primarily in private and charter schools, or is it available in public schools? Thus far, it has mainly been private schools. Um, but the school in Houston is a public school that's an alternative public school for foster kids. And it is out of that program that the drawing came. And that's one of the reasons that I say that I think that this kind of education is especially important for the least advantaged. Yes. Did you say that the elementary program was an after-school program? Did I hear that correctly? So when, it yeah, when I did it in New Orleans, it was always an after-school program. The Houston school is using it in their main school day, and it really just depends on who's using it when they want to use it. Yes? I've noticed that you mentioned the program extending to Uganda. And I'm Mm -hmm. So the school in Uganda is a classical school um, called the, Ref it's one of the Rafiki schools, which is run by a U.S.-based organization that does classical education. And they have Rafiki schools um, throughout parts of definitely East Africa. I don't know if they have any in West Africa. Uh, so the, it has been the same there as it has been in the United States. So we have not differentiated, at least not at this point. And I had a, a wonderful Zoom call with the teachers in Uganda who are using the curriculum, um, and they're using it as an after-school program. And they have said that the kids have enjoyed it quite a bit. That's that would be fantastic. Recently, uh, the state of Florida and the College Board have been having their major argument about much of this. Um, how, how would you see your curriculum being an alternative to that argument in those two different um, significant groups of people in our country coming together to learn about something like this that could bridge potential divisions? Absolutely. Um, so the controversy in Florida is over the AP African American Studies course, right? Um, I think there's always room for a good course in African American Studies, so I, I have no quarrel with that. But what I would say is that I don't think it takes a course specifically in African American Studies to get at everything I've been talking about tonight. In fact, I would prefer that everyone study what I've just talked about, <laughs> right? Um, and so if it is you know, restricted only to African American studies or mainly to African American studies, then I fear many students are not going to get it. So the alternative, yes, I am proposing this as an alternative. Again, I have nothing against African American studies, um, and I think there's a place for 
um, African American studies. But I think for the majority of our students, we need more of this kind of approach. You know, like what I talked about with Phyllis Wheatley and the American founding and so on, her dialogue with George Washington, you know, being around the corner from the Boston Massacre, um, you know, there's Crispus Attucks at the, uh, you know, Boston Massacre. There, there are so many, um, and they're, of course, talking about Native Americans. I think all of that can be taught in a really systematic way. Um, you know, I am older, so, you know, maybe things have changed from when I was in public school, but it, my historical education was abysmal. Um, it was the most deadly, boring, um, repetitive thing, and it was textbook-based. There were no primary documents or anything very interesting. Um, I, I haven't heard many better things lately, so I'm not persuaded that it's improved that much. I do some training with um, K-12 teachers, and in that training, um, I do very much what I've, I've done here, where I will put readings into dialogue with each other um, so that they're doing this deep reading of classic text and founding documents and black writers, um, which I think just all naturally go together. Um, I don't see a reason to have the kind of heated debate we've been having. I, it seems to me like a non-conversation. Um, it seems to dwell on the extremes rather than actually braiding together. We have everything there already. You know, there, there's no need to artificially bring in diversity because it's already there. Um, but a lot of these great writers just are not really studied or known about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could speak to it all about how would you incorporate some of this if you were going to work with adults in a community program that was maybe run by a neighborhood association or some other group that was outside of the formal education system? Run, you said, by a neighborhood association? By a neighborhood association or um, even a museum. I mean, something that's not K through 12, something right. that's focused exclusively on adults. Uh huh. Okay. So, like I said, um, so it would depend a little bit on the educational background of the people that we're talking about. Um, when I've worked with teachers, um, I have them read slightly different things than I do in the curriculum that we do for children. And so this is where we, we will read some really fascinating combinations. You know, for example, um, we'll read Frederick Douglass's speech on the Dred Scott decision together with the um, majority and dissenting opinions, um, not the whole majority or dissenting opinion from the Dred Scott decision, but I will, I will pick excerpts for them to read so that they get this kind of, you know, more holistic sense of, of what was happening. Um, I will have them learn about Frederick Douglass and his changing views on the U.S. Constitution so he started out um, being anti-Constitution because he was in with a group of abolitionists who felt that the Constitution was enshrining slavery. So, you know, with measures like the Three-Fifths Compromise, for example. Um, and so what I will have them do is to look at specific parts of the Constitution that were considered to be problematic. He later changed his mind and said that even though the found, you know, even though the founders may have had some things in their minds that were not for the freedom of black people, the actual words are a blueprint for freedom. And so I'll have them look at that. And then um, I will have them read or either I will tell them about um, sections from um, Madison's notes on the Constitutional Convention. Because in those notes, he gives this great background to each of those controversies. And I think it really does um, some damage to young people when they're just presented with something at face value and they have no idea all of the blood, sweat, and tears that went into that language. And it's just, oh, well, we were just considered three-fifths people, full stop. It, that, it was not that simplistic. All of the debates that went into it, the, you know, the violent denunciations of the North toward the South for wanting to get any credit for enslaved people. So it's very, that's why I'm very fixated on the primary documents. 
if you just read the three-fifths compromise, you can come away with a very different impression than if you are really digging deep into the whole controversy, the whole conversation, what this senator, you know, what this person said and what that person said, and the fierce criticism of the South for insisting that their slaves be counted at all, you lose all of that nuance when you just kind of teach, here's the three-fifths compromise and that's it. Um, so I usually try to kind of bring out those things and to find those documents that help us to get behind what's on the surface level of the text, to have a better understanding of what was going on. You know, so if it were a group that, um, you know, it would depend on if they were comfortable doing the reading in advance or um, if it was a group that, you know, maybe it was more kind of reading aloud there, it would just really depend on, on what the adult group was and what they were comfortable with. One more question. Yeah, your program is very similar to what Ian Rules do in Harlem, which if you're familiar with that, if you're uh, differentiating between this program and what you're doing. <laughs> So I don't know the details of his curriculum. Um, I know what he's doing in general. I am not as aware as his focus on the classics, but I could be wrong there, so I'm not sure. But I would say that I do resonate with the work he's doing very much. Let's give Professor Parham a hand. Thank you. Well, I want to close out by offering a small token of our gratitude to Professor Parham for an outstanding talk this evening. Boy, talk about uh, really what would amount to revolution in American education. Revolution in the old sense of the word of returning mm. to some of the fundamentals, of, you know, the wheel coming back around. And as part of our gratitude, we'd like to give you this uh, little gift to remember us by. And uh, next time we bring you to Michigan, there will be no snow. How about that? <laughs> Good deal. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I got to say, I often introduce programs by asking, are you ready to learn? I want to conclude this one. Did you learn? Yes. Did you learn? Yes. yes. I learned so much watching this. I'm so inspired by what I saw this evening. Did you note the correspondences between what Professor Parham was saying and what is happening in this building? So for example, the emphasis on the virtues, the virtues, moral, spiritual, intellectual, civic. You go through this building, this temple of democracy, and you see virtues written, literally written on the walls. The next time you go through this building, think about Professor Parham's words. Did you notice lives worthy of emulation? When you go through this building, there are two people's lives in particular, President and Mrs. Ford, whose lives are worthy of emulation. We saw again and again in Professor Parham's presentation the emphasis on a virtuous personal life in order to inspire others toward the common good. Those words came again and again in your presentation, the common good. But it begins with emulating the virtuous life that you see here. And just one third correspondence that I would point out. Professor Parham emphasized again and again the importance of education of our youth. And when you go through this building, you're going through more than a mausoleum to the past. We have living education programs here. We have, for example, the DeVos Learning Center, in which you know, Jeff Paulette and I and other people were trying to really instill some of the great lessons that are embodying our best of our civic tradition, our, our history in young people, the 10,000 people with whom we come in contact every year, a number we want to grow, by the way. And then Professor Paulette is also heading up the Ford Leadership Forum at the Ford Foundation. This is a, a program to reach college students and young professionals, not just here in West Michigan, but around the country. In fact, I see several Ford Forum fellows out there. I see Julian and I see Jonathan. I see Christine. Uh, I see a couple of more out there. Raise your hand if you're a Ford Forum fellow. Yes, 
Parm, you, and uh, thank you so much. Think about it. These young people are coming here on a Friday night. So that, that tells you something about the magic of what's going on here. So between the virtues and lives to emulate and the living memorial, the best memorial we can give to President and Mrs. Ford is inculcating the virtues in the rising generation. So if you think there's anything of value from this evening, please consider bringing your friends, your family, to become friends of Ford here. Let's fill up this auditorium. Let's fill it up because we need this message now more than ever. Thank you so much for being here. The sermon stops now with me. Let's go enjoy the cookies out there. Thanks a lot.